Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights, another listener question episode. Just knocking them out here, and hopefully I'll get to yours. If, if I haven't gotten to it yet, it might be because it's duplicative with somebody else or just for whatever reason. I can't do them all, but I can do a bunch of them. And so I hope you'll enjoy the ones that I'm doing today. Thanks, sponsors, Heritage Auctions, Huggins & Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, CompC.com, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, and don't forget the card companies, Panini, Tops, and Upper Deck. First question from Bart McClary talking about the Greg Morris episodes that I had. Bart mentions he likes hearing stories about card protection. He says, like the tightly screwed down, screw downs holders that end up being worse than rubber bands. When I was a kid, mainly rubber bands were the culprit. But at some point, these heavy, lucite, really tight screw downs, maybe there was some perception that <laughs> no air would even get in there, but the card surface could adhere to the lucite when it was pressed so tightly. But rubber bands are still probably public enemy number one because back in the day, if you were rubber banding your cards, generally it damaged at least the top card and the bottom card. And generally there was an indentation for surface or edges where there'd be downgrade of current grading standards more than just the top and the bottom cards. Plus, if you've got a stack, which I had, I used rubber bands back in the early 70s because there weren't as many good supplies that were safe. And it dings the corners. If you've got a rubber banded group of cards that you put on your table, which I did because it was before the showcase era, and if it just came down on the corners would get dinged just by, by virtue of the of, of the brick that you had. And I'd, I'd, I'd wrap them in plastic sometimes, but still... It, if, if you get a ding there, it's going to it's gonna f- soften the corner of, of uh, the top cards or the bottom cards, whatever the case may be. Don't do rubber bands. Don't do screw downs. Uh, there's lots of other choices, safer and, and better. Another one from Beansball Card Blog. My friend Ken said I was searching eBay for something and came across the IDL drugstores cards. That's a Pittsburgh Pirate issue, local drugstore. He said, not sure there's enough for you to do an episode on, but would love to hear more about these. What was IDL drugstores? Never heard of them. I lived in Pittsburgh. I think they were just in Pittsburgh. But uh, Ken, and, and for others, not everything I know, but a lot of what I know is in, in the almanacs and in the old price guides. So I haven't really been uh, day-to-day involved for twenty more than 25 years. But, but since that's a 1963 set... Uh, that I'm well aware of that. And so the information in the almanac was there and I either authored it or approved it. The almanacs and the price guides were organized in such a way that when you look up sets like that, I made the decision not to alphabetize under IDL because you wouldn't necessarily know about that, but it would be alphabetized under P. And then uh, chronologically, the other pirate, it's not a team issue, but it was a local regional um, team issue. My sense is, because I'd always find a bunch of them, I, my, I believe they had to be distributed in, in groups or packs or not packs, but uh, maybe in complete sets. There had to be some promotion at the drugstore. Uh, I, I rarely would find one or two of them. And if you find a short set, it's probably short Clemente <laughs> or Willie Stargell. That's his rookie year or Mazeroski. Even though he was a late Hall of Famer, he was always loved and appreciated in the Pittsburgh area because he was from around there. I think they were probably distributed as part of some promotion. They weren't particularly rare back in the 70s when I was uh, looking for all that stuff. I no longer have my set uh, because uh, when something's oversized like that, I, I just they didn't have the, uh, the supplies. It, it doesn't fit in an 800 count box. I'm sure I got rid of my set. I'm absolutely sure I kept the Clemente. I don't know if I kept the Stargell, but I would have kept the Stargell. But in the 70s, rookie cards were not that much of a thing. Now, in the 70s, Willie Stargell was still a great pirate. So anyway, Ken, I'm not sure whether they're expensive, but if you look in the Almanac, I I don't know that the price on some of those things moves that much because they're just not frequently traded. They're not super tough, but they're nice collectibles. And the oversized aspect probably keeps the price reasonable. Okay, another comment about Rick Probstein and, and the grading conversation I had. And this is from John Keating, the 70s card show, just mentioning that the hobby reflects society and people have an urge to get the absolute best, even though 
it was determined not to be the absolute best. That's not true. If you if you get a PSA 10, you don't know if it's the best or not. If you get a BGS 10 or a black label, you know that's the best. I I really had no problem with what Rick Probstein wanted to do. It, it didn't work out. Uh, but uh, John, I think he did have a lot of confidence to put his additional money on the line to see if he could cross them over. He was taking a chance. He was calculating. Part of what we talked about in the episode is that I didn't agree with his math in, in, in the way he was calculating his odds that he thought it was uh, more likely than I thought because the cards he had were not a random sample. Now, they, he felt they were better PSA 10s, uh, but still, it's difficult to get a, to BGS 10 where it's pristine. It's a higher level. So, Rick, does he have a profit motive? Surely. But there's also some bragging rights and I think he just enjoyed the challenge. This is not going to be affecting his lifestyle, but I think he took it on, John, as a personal challenge. And I think that took guts to do that. I don't think he wasted his money. He got the cards back. He had to pay to find out that these cards did not meet the, the BGS 10 standards. What I was wondering about, because when, when he and I were talking about it, is it what if one of them would have come back as a black label or a BGS 10? Would he have sold it? Or would he have put it up on his wall or, or put it in his collection? My guess is he's going to put it in his collection. He likes really nice cards. He's got some great stuff. And again, I think it's amazing. Even a guy like this that has so much great stuff still sees the value of expert third-party opinion. Anyway, thanks, John, and thanks, Rick, for making that a topic that we could bat around. Let's see. Uh, back in the day, <laughs> in the way we did the price guides, this is another question. There was some perception uh, by me and others, that in the old days, the price guide values for some of the lower price cards were too high. And some of the prices in the price guide for the more difficult cards with lower supply were a little bit low because they were not that actively traded or we didn't find out about it. We were trying as best we could to uh, to do the market. So in the old days, it was more supply oriented. And the way we did it with our price guides is we required a certain amount of evidence to move the price. If we saw uh, activity in that month, we were going to adjust the price if there was activity to support increasing that price. Doing that, though, we, we were not always taking the highest price of what we had seen. I've, I've mentioned before, there's the concept of a trim mean, and if you had 10 sales of the card, we might throw out the lowest and throw out the highest. You'd still be left with... So maybe that meant we were leaving a little meat on the bone in, in a, the perception of what the price guide price ought to be, that you'd have a low and a high there, and that would be uh, representative of what's going on in the market. Not the highest and not the lowest, but a, a reasonable low and a reasonable high. If it did leave meat on the bone, it's the reason why things could go up the next month, because there still was precedent in the whole idea of comps. We were looking at the comps, but we were not taking the highest comp or the lowest comp, at, at least when I was doing it. Fast forward to now, when people are not looking at even the ones in the middle, they're ignoring anything that's real low as an outlier if they're trying to sell the card. Uh, of course, they wouldn't ignore it if they wanted to buy it, but if they were trying to sell it, they're going to be looking at the highest that it's sold for ever, probably. Now, with cards going up and down, you've got situation when the comp is actually matters as well. So I think now, with a more demand-oriented pricing structure, the values are understated for some of these same cards that back in the old days were, were overpriced. I think they're underpriced now because there's low demand in many cases, because there are price adjustments and the market ebbs and flows. So the value can be overstated, in, in my perception anyway, when cards are more uh, high demand, but they're also high supply. And that's what people are promoting. That's what people are chasing. And it makes the price go up, but it might not be long-term sustainable. So that's one of the reasons I go to the dollar box, because I think some of the stuff in the dollar box is worth 5 or $10. If you're wondering, any card I buy in the dollar box, I want to average out at least a dollar of profit. I'm going to lose on some because some of them are not as good as I think, and I'm going to make more than that on others. Just make a dollar a card, and that's fun for me. But that's my point, is that sometimes the cheaper cards that are not in high demand are more undervalued or underpriced. They're, not, they're priced what they're priced. The value, the perceived value, is low because not many people want it, but somebody, I think, will want it at some point. 
and the, and the expensive cards are overpriced because the perception is that everybody wants it. Everybody wants it if it's this great player, as long as the price is reasonable. If the price gets out of hand, then then people are are, are sellers. They're not buyers anymore. They're sellers. Last question now about uh, the series I did with Brian Cappell on the 4849 Leaf Baseball. That's the most discussed set, I think, that I've had. And Game Time Gallery commented, really liked the episode. But specific question, any information on the scarcity differential between the two different Jackie Robinson types that we talked about with the, the side panel kind of thing, columns on the side, whatever it is. The problem with that game time gallery is there's no price guide or grading company, I think, that recognize that those are, as Brian and I talked, are probably legitimate variations, probably enough different. But the, with nobody recognizing it, it's hard to know which one would be more difficult. Now, if you knew which one was more difficult, you'd try to buy it up and think the market will gradually figure that out. The problem is, if people have been doing that, then what you're going to see out there is the easier variation. Uh, one is probably a little better looking, as Brian explained, as they've added uh, definitions. So there might be slightly better eye appeal on one, and that might be more important than the than the distribution. Um, again, there's not a lot of them anyway. Also, back in the day when I was doing these things, I had my own collection that I could observe and, and cards that I saw available just eyeballing. Now you've got all this digital stuff out there where you could just see and do your own, not photo matching, but you could just search for all the photos out there in the digital world and try to see if you can see more of one than another. Bleem, to give a shout out to Levi, who is a pretty outstanding national dealer. He always has multiple copies of some of these cards. And just like the 52 Tops Mantle has two versions, there's not really uh, a big difference in those. And I don't think people are trying to consider a complete set having to have both. Uh, same thing with this Jackie Robinson. Perhaps it could be a variation, but it's probably too late uh, to do that. Then I'm not sure there'd be a value difference. Game Time Gallery, I don't think anybody's been buying up the scarce variations surreptitiously. And if that were the case, we'd only be seeing the easier one. We talked about this with, with Brian. They changed the plates at some point. Almost never. This is something the card companies, tops especially, were, would never really tell us. We'd have to do it empirically to figure out if they were to change the plates halfway through the printing so that half the cards are one half, but that almost never happens. They're either changing the plates early on or later on. You're right to think there probably is a scarcity difference without a value difference. Again, it's just such a great card. John Newman, it's his grail card, and you can't tell John Newman, oh, you got the wrong one. <laughs> if you've got a Jackie Robinson, the Leaf card, that's a spectacular card. I wouldn't throw shade on anybody. You couldn't have the wrong one. There's just one that is just slightly different. At, at arm's length, they're going to look the same. So anyway, thanks, everybody, and continue to enjoy the hobby. Hobby your way, and I'm hobbying my way, and so hopefully that works out. And if you do have two Jackie Robinsons, you're a fortunate person. Thanks again. See you in a couple days. The man